Welcome back to Operating Systems. Today we are going to talk about security. So let's give a quick overview of today's lecture. First, we're going to talk about security problems in general. And then we're going to dig a bit deeper into what operating systems do to ensure security. So first we're talking about permission management and then how this relates to system software in general. And then we'll talk about some reasons for insecure systems, so mostly software bugs, and give some examples and close with some conclusions today. So when we talk about security, we first should define what security actually is because this often gets mixed up with very similar terms. And one of these similar terms is safety. So safety in computer systems is usually protection against risks due to hardware and software errors or failures. So for example, when your computer crashes, you should be able to recover information on your file system. Uh, when you have a bit flip in your RAM, maybe you have some safety uh, so that you can recover the information in the affected memory cells because you store it redundantly. On the other hand, security is actually the protection of users and computers against intended errors. So intended errors are errors that are yeah, usually caused by some actor outside of your system. So it's an attack on your system. Both of these topics are highly relevant for system software. Uh, but today we are going to focus on security topics. And Especially, it's interesting how the security problems in systems can be exploited. So we usually call them security holes, because it's a hole in the protection of our system. And there's two major factors how to exploit a security problem in our system. The first one is malware, so software explicitly built to exploit security problems. And the other one is on a completely different level. This is social engineering. So social engineering means that you actually exploit uh, that humans aren't perfect, so they're maybe too trustworthy or just too sloppy when doing things. So this can be exploited to gain yeah, uh, unallowed access to a system. So what is our objective as operating systems developers when we're going to talk about security? So here we have this sentence broken down into several parts. So we want that someone has to be deterred from doing some unexpected or maybe unwanted things. So let's go into details here. Who is this someone? Someone means that we have an idea of yeah, different identities of different persons using a computer, uh, especially persons allowed to use a computer or a resource of a computer and persons not allowed to do this. And since people tend to work together, we also want to group users or persons together in groups may be related to the course they're just attending at university or the project they're working on. So we need to have an idea of people, so just not provide unlimited access to everyone. And then some people have to be deterred from doing well. What should they do or how, to, how uh, should we deter them? Well, we can use technical methods. So we can use hardware methods, we can use software methods, but we can also use organizational methods, for example, by dividing our organization into appropriate groups and assigning permissions appropriately. So this can deter people from doing things. And what should they do? Some unexpected things. So what the sum is, is actually limited by our imagination. They can try to read your data. So for example, they can try to access some secret documents. They can try to override your data. So they can try to change information, uh, maybe with, even without you noticing. Uh, they can try to run programs they're not allowed to, and so on and so forth. So essentially everything that should not be permitted should be actually disallowed in a system. And what could these things be? Well, unexpected. So as we've said here, unauthorized reading and writing of data. So unauthorized reading breaks secrecy and confidentiality. Unauthorized writing of data, uh, well, violates our data integrity requirements. Working under false flags, so sending 
in the simple case an email as somebody else or maybe doing financial transactions as somebody else would be working under a false flag so this would violate the principle of authenticity and we could also just unauthorized uh, use of resources uh, so this means we could try to use more memory more cpu time more network bandwidth more disk space than we're allowed to do so if we have a multi-user system this might negatively affect other users so this might impact the availability of the system to others and when we talk about security we usually differentiate between internal attacks so internal attacks means we have a user who is actually allowed to use a multi-user system but who tries to exceed the permissions that are actually given to that user and we can also have external attacks external attacks means that there's somebody from the outside so usually coming over a network but it can be something different like trying to uh, read uh, information from electromagnetic radiation produced by our computer so anybody who's actually not at all allowed to use our computer could try to actually gain access to resources of our computer so code data whatever so here's a nice example we had lots of fun with when we were students back then it was on unix so it was text-based and a lot simpler so uh, this is, uh, was very common in well shared computer pools like at schools or universities. Provide a fake login screen. So you are a user who is allowed to use that system, uh, maybe a PC just sitting on a desk or a terminal on a multi-user Unix system. And you write a program or you just uh, get a program from the net that actually simulates the login screen of that operating system that's running. So, for example, we have this uh, Windows NT screen here on the lower right, which has this login screen. And so, when I'm logged into my uh, terminal or to my computer, I just start this program that just looks identical to the real login procedure of my system. So, a login prompt on a text terminal on Unix, maybe. And then I don't log out, but I just leave this program running and then I leave the terminal. So maybe the room or just go to another terminal and observe what people are doing. And so uh, an un unsuspecting user enters the room and comes to this computer or terminal and says, okay, it's free, there's a login screen. Uh, remember, this is my fake login program. And this user then tries to enter his or her credentials. So a username and a password usually and my program then behaves first like a real login program so it records the username and the password that's entered and since this was entered in clear text of course it's unencrypted and then it simulates a failure like for example login incorrect uh, and the user just uh, thinks uh, well okay maybe i have typed my pro uh, password incorrectly so i'll try again so the next time the user is going to try this actually my fake login screen is terminated my login session is terminated so i just call exit for example and then of course the real login screen of the system shows up again and then the user can successfully log in and that user will never know that something like this might happen and i get access to that user's account because i know that user's username and password now and i can access uh, every data and programs that user has access to so uh, this is obviously very problematic and uh, this was well a widespread more or less practical joke we did to other students yeah maybe 30 years later i might uh, just admit this and of course uh, this was a big security problem when there's uh, more at stake than just getting access to whatever some private files on on a shared file system on university server and so, of course, operating system vendors thought about building remedies. And uh, this is what you see here in this uh, Windows login screen. And that's why you have to press this special key combination, Control, Alt, and Delete, to get to that login screen. Because this is a special combination that's actually not passed to an application that can actually capture it. But this is a special combination that's directly handled by the keyboard controller sending a signal to your operating system and when that signal is received your operating system then can then react to it but it is never passed to your application so if you build such a fake login screen application for windows nt a user would try to press ctrl out delete 
and that user would actually never be able to log in because your application would never be able to recognize these keys were pressed. So that's actually why you have to press Control Alt Delete when logging into a at least shared Windows system installation. Another example for a class of software that's problematic regarding security, uh, we call this simply malware, uh, is viruses. And of course, you've all heard about computer viruses before, and maybe you've caught one or the other virus in, in your life already. And maybe you invested lots of time and work to get rid of a virus or to install like virus protection software, and uh, you never were sure if this is really working out. So what's a virus? A virus is program code that's actually inserted into another legitimate program and uh, which usually has functionality to replicate itself into other computers or other programs. In this case, into other programs. And uh, this means that the virus itself is just part of the code base of this new program. So it's doing nothing until this infected program is executed. So for example, uh, you have a virus that affects your Microsoft Word executable. And this means unless you start Microsoft Word, this virus cannot do anything. And as soon as Microsoft Word is started, there are some control passes in the program which are modified by the virus. So whenever, for example, you do a spell check, your virus gets activated and maybe it's a joke virus, replaces all users of one word by a different word just to fool with the user. Of course, there's all definitely more malicious use cases for this. So uh, this uh, starting of a program does not only mean that this program will be effect infected, but also that this virus tries to propagate throughout the system. So it looks for other application binaries it is able to infect and then copies its code over to this new binary. So for example, the next time you start Excel, this virus will also be uh, active. And execution of viruses can also be time controlled, so they can maybe only be activated at a certain date or a certain time of day. And this has been used, for example, well, for practical jokes, like a virus that only starts on April 1st, or for political purposes, like a virus that starts on a special day, like an election day, and then sends out political messages, stuff like this. And there are very many sorts of viruses out in the wild. So back then when, uh, well, uh, your floppy disks or really uh, just exchanging data uh, using, well, portable media was really common. Uh, it was common to have boot sector viruses. So a boot sector virus is a virus that's executed at system startup time. So it's contained in the very first sector of your hard disk usually, or your floppy disk, which is the boot sector. So it's a very small program because the boot sector usually is only 512 bytes long, and it still has to be able to boot your system. So this would execute at system startup time and then because it controls the boot up of your system, can influence what your operating system is doing. Another common class of viruses are macro viruses here. So very many programs actually contain their own, what we call domain specific language, something like Visual Basic, for example, uh, which allows a user to program the functionality of that program. So for example, to write applications doing some special calculations in Excel. And uh, since, uh, yeah, well, these macros are just executable code, it's Turing complete, scriptable programs like Word or Excel actually can catch such a macro virus that actually also tries to reproduce then not through program execution, but through documents you pass along, for example, a PowerPoint presentation or an Excel uh, file that you may be sent by email. And of course, you can have executable programs itself as a virus uh, for example, something that, uh, well, gets inadvertently started and then tries to propagate throughout your system. And as we've seen, this uh, sort of soft malware, so these viruses can be distributed through a number of ch uh, channels. So very common was at least the exchange of storage media back then floppy disks. Nowadays, it would be like USB memory sticks. Uh, very common are email attachments. So uh, an email attachment that masquerades, for example, as an Excel file, and when you double click it, in fact, it's an executable file. And when your mail client is configured incorrectly, this executable file is started and can then start to propagate its viruses. And it can also be just distributed 
by web pages. So for example, a web page using a security hole in your web browser and then downloading and even executing some malicious code. A completely different example of security problems is social engineering. Social engineering is not a problem of the system software itself, but a very important one, so uh, it's important to mention it here. So, so social engineering is actually a method to gain access to information by exploiting human errors. So for example, uh, well, uh, you've all received emails uh, pretending to be from your bank or maybe from NTNU or uh, from uh, whatever uh, government institution. So uh, these attackers usually try to fool the user into thinking this email is legitimate and to click on a link contained in that email. And that link, of course, doesn't go to your bank website or to your NTNU website, uh, website or whatever, but to a website that looks very similar. Uh, and this means that uh, these attackers try to obtain data of an internet user, maybe, yeah, like login data again for, for online banking or 10 numbers or something like this using forged addresses. So like domain names with similar names or a typo in it that's hard to recognize. And uh, this is called phishing. So essentially you throw out some bait and some of the users actually fall victim to that bait and then they're fished well. And so they give up inadvertently private data, which might have severe consequences. Like if you gain, if an attacker gains access to your online banking account, uh, that attacker may be able to transfer money to, uh, well, uh, shady accounts uh, somewhere in the Caribbean or something like this. Another method uh, that's also very common is called farming. So obviously there's, uh, well, a pattern in naming these things. And farming means that actually uh, DNS, so name service requests on the internet by web browsers are manipulated. So uh, accesses of the web browser that you think are going to maybe your bank website are actually redirected, for example, to a bank website, well, to, to an attacker website that's forged to exactly look like your bank website. So when you do a transaction there, essentially, uh, well, uh, the attackers gain access again to all your credentials here. And this has worked very well when uh, there was no security in uh, HTTP so hypertext transfer protocols, uh, communication. Nowadays we have encrypted communication. So we have HTTPS and uh, every web server out there should actually fall back to HTTPS. So to secure transfers, which are cryptographically uh, in, uh, yeah, secured. Uh, but uh, what does it mean? So essentially when uh, you go to this website in inadvertently of this attacker that looks like your bank website, you maybe get a warning like, oh, this is an invalid security certificate. And most of the users actually don't know what to do in this situation. And they're very trained by, for example, using Windows for decades, that whenever there's a problem, the only way to remedy this is just click OK. It will be OK. I have no idea what this stupid computer wants from me. So I'll just accept this. And this is, of course, highly dangerous. So if there's a warning that this website might contain malicious code or might somehow try to access your data in a way you don't want this to, if there is a warning by the browser, please take this warning seriously. Of course, sometimes these warnings may be unwarranted. So the re the, there may be cases when a real security certificate expires and the administrator of that site just hasn't noticed. But then again, it's better to be safe than sorry. So this is all social engineering. So uh, the well, user is being exploited because the user is unsuspective and maybe even naive about who is trying to get access to his or her data. So when we're talking about security and operating systems or system software in general, we're mostly concerned with software at the moment. So uh, this software that does something you don't want on your system is uh, something we call malware. And this term malware comes from the terms where from software, obviously, and mal from malicious. So it's doing something well, nasty in the broadest sense of the word. And we've already seen viruses. So viruses 
are programs that are inadvertently distributed by a user by executing a program. They try to infect other programs, so they insert their own executable code into other programs, and they reproduce this way. So a virus requires active participation of a user. Well, the user doesn't know he's actively participating, so a virus actually requires a user to, for example, start a certain program, and that replication is initiated. On the other hand, there are also worms. So worms do not wait for user actions to propagate to another application or another computer, but worms uh, contain code to actively try to invade new systems over the internet. So usually by, well, looking for other systems with a certain security vulnerability, like a certain version of maybe a web server that has a security problem connecting to that one, sending exactly the sequence of information that's required to exploit the security hole, and then infecting that other computer here. And worms, worms are the basis, for example, for botnets. So these large-scale networks, for example, of Windows computers, that can then be used to uh, run denial of service attacks or to uh, send spam emails or whatever uh, can happen. And then there's a third class of malware that was uh, very popular like in previous decades, which is uh, Trojan horses or simply called Trojans. So this of course relates to the old story of the Greeks trying to conquer the ancient city of Troja and sending a gift horse in which uh, then Greek soldiers were hiding trying to well, take over the city uh, when this gift horse was brought by the unsuspecting uh, citizens of that city that's to be attacked inside of their city walls. And that's exactly what a Trojan horse program also does. So it's a program disguised, disguised as a useful application. So here is a great new free game. Just download it and use it. And this program actually contains a great free game, maybe. But it also contains additional functionality. And this additional functionality is provided without the user noticing. So, for example, uh, this Trojan horse program, whenever you start your great new free game, it also opens a port on your network interface that allows an attacker to connect to your system to gain a shell. So it can uh, then enable an attacker to just yeah give another, well, non-permitted user access to your computer. And finally, another uh, broad characterization of malware gives us a force type, which is a rootkit. So a rootkit is a collection of tools to disguise future logins or actions of an attacker and to hide processes and files. So a rootkit means that, uh, well, the attacker actually has at least the permissions of the super user of a system, so root in Unix terms. And a rootkit is usually installed after a computer system is compromised. So we need a security hole in the first place, and the security hole can then be exploited to permanently install software on system level or even below system level on virtualization level. And this rootkit manipulates your operating system uh, to hide itself. So even if you, well, are, well, suspecting something's going wrong on your computer and you try to figure out using tools to list your processes and to list, to list your files. Is there something on my computer that doesn't belong there? Actually, these tools have been manipulated to hide the uh, rootkit and the rootkit's activities from the user. So for example, the process display tool, PS for process status manipulate, not to display any processes that have the name malware. Well, yeah, that's a stupid example, obviously. The directory listing tool, ls, has been manipulated not to display certain file names of executables and files. And uh, tools to display network connections like Netstat have, for example, been manipulated not to show an open network service on a port which you've never configured in your system. This could also take place not by manipulating uh, the binaries of executables directly, but because we have shared libraries in our systems like our C library, this can also take place by just manipulating the C library. So every program that's trying to use the C library would actually be affected by this problem here. Or you can even directly manipulate the operating system kernel, for example, by loading a dynamically loaded kernel extension or kernel module. That's, for example, uh, the reason why OpenBSD has actually deprecated the use of kernel modules again after having them for several decades, I'd say, uh, whereas other 
systems like uh, Windows or Linux still have kernel modules, which uh, make it easier just to insert code on kernel level while the system is running, so without rebooting it or something. So very often malware isn't easy to categorize in one of our categories here, but malware uses a combination of these types. For example, it uses a security hole to break into a system, then to execute some unwanted code to then finally install a rootkit into your system. So what can we try to avoid spreading of malware around and in general to keep our data and programs secure from, well, any unwanted accesses? So the first thing we should do is we need to enable our system to have an idea of permissions. So essentially, if you have some data on your disk, who is actually allowed to access this data. So the objective of this permission management is to protect information that's stored in your computer from breaches of confidentiality. So somebody reads data that is not permitted. Uh, theft of information, so this might be copying data out. And of course, unwanted manipulation. And this includes a relatively recent trend. So this might include just uh, malware encrypting data on your disk, so all of your files, and then uh, just uh, telling the user, oh yeah, your, all your files have been encrypted. Unfortunately, this encryption key is a secret key, which is only known to the attackers. So if you want to get your data back, so be able to decrypt it, pay us whatever, a number of bitcoins. And so we'll promise to send you this decryption key. Well, never trust criminals, obviously. So it's always better to have backups and with ransomware that encrypts also like it happened in several larger companies uh, well networked volumes so all your data stored somewhere else it's actually good to have offline backups so backups on the disks that are not directly connected to a computer unless you're doing a backup so whenever you have a case of ransomware you are able to actually restore data from your backup and this ransomware would be unable to just also encrypt your backups, which of course would be fatal. And this has to happen in all multi-user systems. So in all users where more than one user has access to the system. So traditionally these were big, for example, Unix machines where uh, you had dozens or hundreds of terminals, for example, for students. But nowadays, of course, every system or most of the systems uh, is connected to the internet. And so essentially you open connections to the internet so you have code from multiple users running on your system. How can this happen? Well, just call a web page in your web browser and there's some JavaScript on that web page. That code was not written by you. You don't actually know what that code was doing. Nevertheless, it's executing on your system. So you need to set limits for this code. So you don't want this JavaScript code, for example, to read all your personal files and transfer to whoever is running that website. So essentially nowadays you have to assume that every system connected to the internet is a multi-user system. So this system needs permission management to be operated in a secure way. So to enable effective per per permission management, uh, we have some requirements to fulfill. So first, we need to figure out what the components of our system are. So who's interested in what? So first we have objects in a system. This object might be a file. This might be an executable program. Uh, whatever it might be worth to protect in your system. So all objects of a system must be first identifiable. So we must know that when something is accessed, it's this object here. And this identification must be unique and it must be unforgeable. Then uh, also users of a system, might be internal and external users, must be also identifiable. So every user must have some sort of ID and this must also be unique and this must be unforgeable. So whenever a user wants to use a system, we need this user to authenticate him or herself uh, and then just assign this user identity after successful authentication, for example, using a username and a password. And then if we have objects in the system and we have users, we have to connect these objects to users. So essentially we have to grant or deny access to objects by a given user. And this is based on permissions. So only if a user 
has the required permissions to access a given object in our system, then the operating system actually does the action that's requested, for example, opening and reading a file, and in all other cases, an error message is returned to the program the user is executing, maybe permission denied as an error. So access to objects should then only be allowed using this appropriate object management. So there should be no other way to access objects. For example, if you have files, your usual open, read, write calls, then check for permissions. So when you try to open a file, you don't have permission to open, you get an error. But if you have a second way to access this data of a file, for example, if you were allowed to read the physical data in the blocks of your disk, you could then build something like a file system in user space that actually tries to reconstruct all the data structures we've seen in file systems and then still read that data from the raw disk, even if the official way of opening files, for example, would not permit it. So this is called a side channel and side channels uh, exist on very many levels from the hardware to a high level software. And these are very difficult to find, uh, especially since most of them are obviously inadverted and some of the most modern attacks and we'll talk a tiny bit about the recent um, spectrum uh, meltdown attacks of the last three or four years. And some of these actually have been using side channels, which are very complex to understand at first. So in the optimal case, we ensure that access to objects only takes place using this object management, which is part of your operating system. So this means that permissions to objects must be stored in an unforgeable way again. And if you want to transfer permissions to another user, for example, then this transfer of permission also must take place in a controlled way. So controlled means usually controlled by the operating system. And on the other hand, it must also be possible to validate these pre uh, basic pre uh, protection mechanisms with low overhead. So essentially, uh, enabling security of your system should not reduce the performance, for example, of your system significantly. So when designing a permission management system for system software, there are some important design principles you should follow. The first design principle is the principle of least privilege. So whenever a person, a user, or a software component requires access to some object, to some resource of, on your system, well, you should allow it but you should be very specific in what you allow. So for example, whenever you want access to one certain file, you should not give permission to read all the files in a directory because that would unnecessarily extend the permissions to any other files in that directory, which is absolutely not required. And even if this program itself would not do anything malicious, maybe a bug in that program could be exploited then to actually make use of these extended permissions. So the principle of least privilege says that a personal software component should be allowed only those permissions that are required for the functionality of that software or whatever is to be implemented to be realized. And so the standard case is to just say no. So just to deny permissions to everything unless there's an explicit uh, permission telling the system that this access is allowed. Now this sounds very German, doesn't it? Uh, unfortunately, uh, usual Unix systems have a pretty big counterexample. So this counterexample is the super user account in Unix systems, which is called root. So whoever is able to get root access to a system, either legitimate because that user has been given the root password or illegitimate because of some security holes or even social engineering, then that user might do everything on the system. So this user might be able to read all the files, it might write all the files, it might delete files, it might start programs, it might remove users from a system where usually you only want this for very specific tasks. And this is not only a security measure but also a safety measure because I think every system administrator working on Unix system as root has done some mistakes that led to destruction of data or unavailability of systems. So this also happened to me several times. And so it's always good to have backups in these cases or to have this principle of least privilege, even if this makes using the system a bit more cumbersome. A second design principle is that you should have fail-safe defaults. 
So for example, if you have newly installed server software, you should, for example, just disable all the services of that server software at first, and then require whoever installed that software to actually manually enable just these services that are required by the service software here. And finally, you should ensure the separation of duties as a design principles. So if there's multiple conditions to allow an operation, you should actually be able to separately consider them and not just to lump them together into one specific big condition. So this permission management component of our operating system has to keep track of objects in our system. So all, for example, files that have to be uh, protected in our system and also of subjects in our system. So the, usually the users. So to keep uh, track of the permissions, we need to have a, uh, well, essentially a combination of subjects and objects. And wherever this specific combination is activated, so a process started by a certain user, so a subject is trying to access a file, so an object, we need to be able to look up the uh, permissions of that subject to the object. So essentially we can store uh, all of this information in a big table, which we call the access matrix. And so the element of the matrix here, uh, every row in our access matrix identifies a subject. So user one, user two, user three, for example. But these might also be processes. For example, this might happen on your Android phone where user IDs are actually app used to uh, specify the permissions of processes because there's usually only one user on a mobile phone. And uh, the other uh, dimension here are columns actually identify the objects. So this might be files, data, but also devices, processes, memory, and so on. And then when you have the intersection of an object and a subject, so a subject tries to access an object, you need to figure out which operations on that object are actually permitted. So you need to split up the permissions into more fine-grained parts. For example, you might want to enable a user to read a file so the user can access the data in a file, but that user should be unable to write to the file. So you would deny write permissions, but you would enable read permissions. So these permissions here given for a certain subject trying to uh, access a certain object here are then more specific. Uh, depending on which operations actually are allowed for that object here. And the question that is asked by the operating system whenever a subject tries to do an operation on an object here, is this operation, well, read, write, delete, execute, given the subject here, user 4711, and the object file 23 actually permitted here. And this is then done by just looking this up in our access matrix and then figuring out is this a yes or a no? More or less, yeah, just a binary decision then. A very basic model of our access matrix is uh, implemented using file or process attributes. So we have several properties in our system related to a user. So whenever we execute a process, this process is assigned to a user. So when we start a process as a user, uh, the operating system knows that we are the user who started that process here. We also need to know for every file which user is the so-called owner of a file. So the owner of a file is usually the one who created that file, but ownership can also be transmitted to a new owner using, for example, the CHO, change owner program on Unix. And we also need to know which permissions the owner of a file gives to, well, the owner of the file uh, itself and which permissions does the owner of that file give to any other users of the system. And so permissions of a process when a process tries to access a file means that the attributes of, attributes of processes means that we have to look up the user ID and for files we have to actually consider the owner ID of that file here to actually figure out if for example a read access is permitted for that file. Now to implement this access matrix, we have several variants we could use. So if we uh, consider the columns here, so if we actually enter information on columns, we would have something we call access control lists. So essentially 
uh, for every object, which is represented by a column in our access matrix, the access permissions are validated based on the identity of the requesting subject, so the user. So that means every object, so for example, every file in our system has a list of users. Uh, and for each user, it has again a list uh, of yeah, the operations this user is actually allowed to perform on that file. Now you can also look at your access matrix in a different dimension. So if you look at rows, you're looking at users. So this gives you so-called capabilities. So capabilities means that for every access to an object, a property is validated and this property is owned by the subject and this property can also be passed to other subjects on demand. So every user that has a list of which files that user is actually allowed access to and which operations that user is allowed. And this is usually stored in some special additional meta information, like for example, unused bits of a memory address for capabilities to certain regions of memories. And finally, we can have a third variant here this is rule-based, and this is so-called mandatory access controls. So this means whenever there's an access happening, there's a rule uh, helping the system to evaluate if this user is actually allowed this uh, specific access or not. So let's first talk about access control lists or just ACLs. As we've seen, this is a column-wise view of the access matrix. So for every object, in addition to data of the object, we also store information about who is actually allowed to access, so which subjects are allowed to access this object, and in which way, so read, write, and so on. So ACLs indicate for every object which subjects are allowed to perform which operations on this object. So ACLs obviously need to be configured, and they can be configured either by subjects, so users, having an appropriate ACL entry granting the permission. So here we have something a bit recursive. So we actually we have an entry in our ACL that tells the system that a certain user is actually allowed to change the ACLs. Or, of course, the creator of the file or object, uh, for example, when creating or modifying a file, might also configure who is actually allowed to do which operations on that file. And one example for this is more than 50 years old already. So this was one of the first major attempts to build a multi-user operating system. This is so-called Multix operating system. And the Multix operating system uh, recorded uh, uh, this information on access control lists in a, in a triplet, which contained information about a user, a group of a user, and permissions here. So for example, we had different files, file 0 to 4 here. And for file 0, we had a user Jan in any allowable group. So this is what the asterisk means. And this user is allowed. This, these permissions here, R stands for read, W stands for write, and X stands for execute. File 1 uh, allows uh, read, write, execute access to user Jan in group system here. File 2 has multiple users here with different access rights. So Jan has read and write access, else has only read access, and Maike has read and write access. File three, as long as you're in group student, any user you have read access to, so that might be, for example, a shared piece of example code on a file system for an assignment here. And for file four, you could also have something like a user here not having access at all, so that user has been declined access, whereas any user in a group student might get read access. And this is, of course, also implemented in more modern operating systems. So, for example, Windows, starting with Windows NT, has uh, objects that have allow and deny entries, and also entries for full control, modify, read and execute, and so on. Access permissions in Unix are a very simple form of access control lists. So these are reduced because Unix was originally built on very small and simple machines, where actually it would have been quite a significant overhead to store access control lists. So uh, on Unix, we have a very simple way. Uh, in Unix, processes have a user ID and a group ID. So that's usually the user ID and group ID of the user who has started the process, but this can also be changed. And on the other hand, files in a system have an owner and also a group. 
that file belongs to. And permissions to a file are related to the user, which is the owner of the file, the group, and all the others. So if you have a file here, like file.tech, uh, you might have a user Michael, and that user Michael has read and write access. Uh, you might have uh, people in a group stuff, where usually that user Michael would belong to, and all others in that group stuff only have read access, whereas if I'm also in that group and have and am the user Michael, I also have write access, and all the others don't have any access to that file at all. So they can maybe see that file in the file system, but they cannot look at the contents of that file. So file attributes are stored in three bits per permission group, so three bits for the user, three bits for the group, three bits for all others, and these indicate three possible access methods, so R stands for reading a file, and this is just binary yes or no, so it's stored in a bit. W stands for writing the file, and X stands for executing a file. Now this very simple approach to permission management in Unix has a number of problems. So for example, uh, what uh, can we do to enable multiple users to actually change? data in a file, but only under program control. So, for example, uh, we want to keep a high score list for a game. That might just be a simple like text file of a username and the number of points. And uh, this is stored in just a text file high score list, like in my home directory somewhere below games Tetris. There may be Tetris high scores, but of course all users of my great Tetris program should be able to enter their high score there. And of course, I don't want the users to cheat, so I only want the users to be able to enter their high score whenever they have executed the Tetris program and achieved a high score, but not using a regular text editor where they can just open the text file and just edit it. So this is a bit problematic, and we have uh, to enable functionality to do this. So the first idea would be to just allow all users to have write permissions to our high score list file here. And this means that we have given too many permissions. This does not work because, as I said, a user would then be able to just cheat and edit this high score file with a text editor and edit 1 million points to his high score, uh, which would mean that obviously other users would not be so happy about it. So we would need some other way to do this. And this way in Unix is called setUID, so set the user ID. And this works by only allowing one user write access to a file. But when the program that should have access to that file is executed, then the owner of that program changes, no, the, uh, the user ID of that program changes from the user who has started that program to actually a user who has the permissions to, for example, change this high score file. So we would need to modify the permissions for our Tetris executable file, which might be that one here. And we would give this file the so-called set UID, set user ID permissions. And this means as soon as whatever user is trying to start my Tetris program, as soon as this program is executed, this program uh, is this process is then assigned the user ID of the owner of that executable program. So I'm the owner of that program here. I'm the only one having write access to the high scores file, but when anyone on that system starts reusing my Tetris program, then actually this Tetris program, when the set UID permissions are actually given, starts under my user ID and would then be able to write to my high score file. Of course, it would also be able to read all my files, to write or delete all my files. And this is problematic. So when you grant permissions like this, you have to be really, really sure to know what you're doing. So how does the set UID mechanism work? Now on Unix, you have users and processes, and each process represents a user. Of course, a user can have multiple processes, but each process is assigned a specific user ID in the system, and it has more attributes. So it has the attribute of the user ID, and also of the group ID under which it is started. But then again, it also has additional attributes called the effective user ID and the effective group ID. So these are not the real user ID and group ID who started that program, but this indicates when these are different to the actual user ID and GIDs that a transfer of permission has taken place, usually using the set UID mechanism.
So the effective user ID and effective group ID actually determine the permissions that a process has when, for example, accessing files. Only a few highly privileged processes are actually allowed to change their own user ID and group ID. Uh, one of these is the login process. So uh, the login process needs to change the uh, user ID and group ID of the of its child process because the login process runs as system administrator pro uh, because it needs to have access to your password files, for example. And then it verifies your username and password. And then it, for example, starts a shell for you. And that shell should start under your user ID. So the user ID of the person who just logged in. And this means that the uh, user ID of essentially uh, the uh, process that was forked by login to enable your shell, that needs to be changed to whoever user has just tried to log in. All other processes are children of login. So when you log into a system, all of these processes are children of the login process. And these run under your user ID and obviously not under the super user user ID. And since child processes, as we've seen, inherit parent attributes, all of the other child processes, so any process your shell starts, for example, then inherits all of your user and group ID and also the effective ID attributes. So this file, that contains trustworthy program code, like my Tetris program, uh, is given an additional permission bit in Unix to indicate this set UID mechanism. That's the S bit here. So that's indicating we have set UID enabled. So set UID actually implies that this file has to be executable because if we couldn't execute it, then set UID wouldn't make sense. So when you do a directory listing and you see an S instead of an X, uh, in the uh, file permissions here. This means that the SUID bit is actually set for that file. So whenever you execute that file, then actually the effective user ID of that file is the user ID of the user who owns that file. So the owner of the executable file. There's also a set group ID bit that's relatively rarely used, but it works in the same way just for groups. So when you execute a set UID program, the executing process obtains the user ID of the program owner and sets its effective user ID to that user ID. So precisely it's the user ID of the file containing that program that you just executed. And uh, the process execution of that set UID process uh, continues using the permission of this user, so of the user owning that executable file, as long as that program is not terminated. And of course, again, this contradicts the principle of least privilege because I would need this set UID permission in my Tetris program only for writing to that uh, high score file and not for any other, for example, file operations on my system I would be doing. Uh, so that's very problematic uh, because that can open lots of security problems on your system again. Uh, there's workarounds, for example, uh, that's what's done on Android, which is based on Linux. Uh, so uh, this creates special users for an application instead of, for example, using root. Uh, so essentially, uh, you have special users with special files that don't indicate real users of a system, but which indicate, for example, uh, just uh, files belonging to a certain program that are not actually related to a user that can actually log in. And it's actually considered good programming style to retar return any set UID privileges you get, so any set UID permissions, as soon as they're no longer required by a process, which might be difficult in Tetris, of course, because you write the high scores at the end, so you ne would need to retain them all the way until you maybe terminate your program. So let's look at the example for our high score list again. So uh, we have our shell running, we are user Fritz, we belong to our group ID students, and as long as we don't execute any set UID program, our effective user ID and effective group ID are identical to our user and group ID in our system. So then we have these two files in our file system. We have the executable for Tetris here, and this executable says it's uh, owned by user Michael, owned by group Tetris, and uh, we have the permissions R and S for user Michael here. So this means Michael can read the file and can execute the file. And whenever that file is executed, uh, it has the set UID bit set. So the effective user ID of the process executing Tetris changes to the user ID of Michael. Then, of course, 
we need all the other users to gain access to that program so to be able to execute it and let's say we just want to restrict uh, the users who are allowed to use the tetris program to users in a special group tetris here so a user can be in separate groups on the unix system here so if you're also in a user group tetris then you're allowed to just execute that file but you're not allowed to read or write that file and all the others unfortunately are not allowed to play tetris now our high score files high scores file then is also owned by user Michael here. And Michael has full read and write access to our high scores. So Michael is the one who can manipulate the high scores. Of course, all the others should be able to look at the high scores independent of starting a Tetris binary. And well, so all the groups, the group Tetris and all the others, well, they should not know about high scores in Tetris at all. So when I then start my Tetris program, the first thing that's done is that the shell forks itself as you've seen in your shell implementation so essentially we have a shell process that still runs with all the inherited attributes essentially effectively still running under the effective user id of fritz now the problem is that well fritz when we started uh, our program with these privileges here has no permission to write the high score file because uh yeah even though Fritz might be maybe in the group Tetris, Fritz doesn't get right permission to this one here. So uh, we need to somehow enable now our started program to actually get right access. And this would mean that the effective user ID would need to change. And that's exactly what's happening when I now exec my Tetris executable here. So this uh, causes the operating system to look at the execute permissions and it figures out oh there's not only execute it's set uid permissions so the os gets the user id of michael changes the effective user id of the tetris process so the process running the tetris program to michael and this would mean now i have access to my high score file unfortunately set uid is rather the source of a large number of problems in unix so we extend the permissions of a user exactly for the case of using the given program, which means the owner of the program actually has to trust the user who is using the program. And this owner can be the administrator, but it can also be normal users. Now the problem showing up here is that of course programs can have bugs and these bugs can result in significant extensions of permissions. So for example, if there's a bug like a buffer overflow, this would enable to call a shell from your process and this shell would run under your user permissions. So whoever gets access to a shell uh, when well exploiting a security hole in this program would get access to all of your files because then the effective user ID would be the user ID of you who actually provided that set UID program. So in practical experience, uh, this shows that in Unix systems still far too many permissions are granted here. So uh, regularly security problems show up just because of exactly this permission extension here. 